nine to five. Hello, this is Mitch, and welcome to the 1000 Houses podcast. I'm here with Ben Humble. He's over from Arizona, but he is a traveling man. Now, let me tell you, he's been around for about 15 years, moving and shaking. And uh, I was trying to narrow him down to the strategy he does, but he's kind of like anybody who's in the business for a long time. They they probably start with one strategy, at least I did, to, to, to perfect that, to get my get my feet solid on the ground and to make sure I had some finances and some cash in the bank and all that. But then, you know, I started kind of branching out and would try other different um, strategies. And after a while, you get pretty good at all of them, or at least you know the ones that you'll do in sub two and the ones you won't do in sub two. You know, like me, if I'm going to do a sub two, it has to have a hell of a margin, like a really big margin, because I don't want to build a a fortune or a, a, a tens of thousands of deals on, on something that could be technically called by a bank at any day. So I don't want to build, you know, my whole thing on that. But with no further ado, Ben, how are you doing? My brother, thank you for having me. Good to be here, man. Let's let's change the game for some of the audience members. Let's help them out. Yeah, that's the whole thing. I was telling him before the show in the green room, like this show is really about helping someone find their financial freedom if you haven't figured it out yet. Let's just figure that out. If it's real estate, great. Maybe yeah. we can help. If it's not, I'll help you. However, sometimes the podcasts I do, the people that I interview, they don't have anything to do with real estate. They have to do with someone who found their own way down a different path. And if that's the way you want to go, more power to you. I don't really care. The point of it is get financially free and become the person you want to become. Let's take you back to the beginning. Ben, tell us about the start. Man, the very beginning, I was born in Romania during communism in 85. My dad had five little kids and he made a choice to escape communism by running across the border. So he ran, he had to leave two kids behind in the process. A few months later, a Romanian president was killed on live television. And in 1989, Christmas day, Romanians were liberated from a dictator. So shortly after we were reunited, applied to come to North America and Canada accepted us. So dad, five kids, six kids, actually mom had a child in the refugee camp. Six kids come to Canada. They have three more children and we have the immigrant life. Mom and dad work two, three jobs. We're working as kids. And I knew from very young, if you wanted something in this world, you go get it. Simple as that. So I was a musician growing up and that's what I wanted to do my whole life. Um, you know, university, I went to music for a couple of years. And at one point my dad said something to me and he said, um, you know, son, I wish I would have made more money as he was doing his life and his finances. And I thought about it for a brief second, Mitch. And I said, well, you don't have to because you made me. And I realized that that was it was my time to carry the torch. So I went on a journey over the subsequent 15 years of real estate investing and business ownership. And that's how I got into this whole thing is dropping out of university, being a music kid, C student at best, didn't give a rip about school. Um, I just wanted to, I just wanted to play my music. So I'm very blessed today where I get to come back. I'm in one of my studios here today and I get to come back and play music and travel and do all the stuff I'd love to do. Cause real estate was always a vehicle for me to get me to a point of financial stability for me and my family. So let's yeah, keep so it did going. You take, so you're taking care of your mom and your dad. Are they still with us? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Mom's retired and dad's getting close and you know, they live in an awesome uh, house in Canada. Um, and I bring them out here and we, we travel and we do stuff together. And it's an incredible thing to be a son. We all, we all have something that we got to do. You know, we all have an opportunity in life to define. And for me, it's the finances for my family. I'm the one, I'm the one who defines it, who helps, you know, who keeps the financial engine moving forward. And I'm Matt, you know, my, my big calling in life is this, this humble brand is regardless of where you start, it doesn't matter. You ultimately decide based on choices where you end up. And every single person can be financially free, but you got to make a choice and you've got to honor those choices when you make them. One of the things that, that struck me the hardest, it was one of those revelations in life. I read, a, I read a definition of financial freedom that said financial freedom happens when your wants and your needs are exceeded by your passive income, which I quickly changed the word passive to cash flow because I don't believe in passive. There's no passive income. If you don't believe me, just be passive and don't watch your income and watch what happens to it. So when financial financial freedom happens, when your wants and your needs are exceeded by your uh, cash flow. Um, and the first one of the first revelations was at the time to be financially free, I needed to make $3,500 a month to not have to have a job because that's what my job was paying me. 
And I thought to myself, financial freedom is not wealthy. It has nothing to do with wealth. It's just like a stepping stone along the way. What I did figure out is if I was going to be wealthy, it would probably start by first becoming financially free. So I didn't have to have a job, so I could free up 2,600 hours a year that I could work on me or my business, right? What was your, did you ever have a job? I had a job um, when I was in university. Yeah, I had a job. The last job I had was I was cleaning floors, cleaning carpets and cleaning floors for a guy. And when I dropped out of university, the very first thing I did, I didn't know how to do anything but clean. Every immigrant knows how to clean. We can clean crap all day. Dropped out of school, started a cleaning service. That's it. I got a loan from the bank to buy a cleaning machine. My very first customer was my mom. She let me clean my own room and paid me a hundred bucks. <laughs> that's, that's how I started cleaning, right? And I, I had that cleaning service for a, for a couple of years before I read, I read a few books. Interestingly enough, one of them was Becoming Wealthy One Single Family House at a Time. That book was awesome. I read that book and it shaped the way that I thought about real estate. So I bought my first deal at, I was 21 years old when I bought my first property with Creative Finance. It was a duplex. And by the time I closed on the deal and moved into it, I was paying $156 a month plus utilities to own this duplex. And that's how I got out of my mom's basement and into real estate. Okay. So what, what, what gave you the nerve to buy this thing? What book were you reading? I was reading every book. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I read, you know, single family books, creative finance books. I realized that if I wanted to get ahead, I got to get, I had to get around people who knew. So I was going to conferences, you know, these weekend workshops and conferences where people throw, I was going to Toronto traveling three, four hours to go back and forth to these events. And somebody, I read in a passage somewhere and somebody reminded me one day, said, hey, if you want to get rich, you can become a millionaire if all you do is buy a million dollars worth of real estate. And I said, cool. So then you have these people called customers or tenants. They pay it off for you. Over 25 years, you're a millionaire. And I instantly realized, dude, I'm cleaning floors. I'm doing grunt work. That sounds like a better deal than the deal I had. So I instantly decided I'm going to be in real estate. So I didn't have any real estate professionals in the family. I had an uncle who was a realtor and, and um, I just got into it, whatever I could do. I went to bit local business meetup groups talking about business because I was in the cleaning service and I used that to ask about real estate. Eventually I met a mortgage broker who also owned a duplex who really wanted to sell it. And he's the guy who sold me the duplex. He helped me get the financing. So dude, I was just getting in. I didn't know what I didn't know. I was just getting in one day at a time, knocking on doors, talking to people, going to meetup groups and saying, how do I get into real estate? I don't have credit. I just launched my cleaning service and I can't get bank, bank financing. So what can I do? And you learn, you learn by asking questions. Well, I think it's real important that we, we, we end the dilemma right now uh, for anyone listening. Uh, it takes money to make money. Bullshit. If that was the case, no one, no one would, would be rich. You know what I mean? I, I saw the other day a survey that um, only 5% of all millionaires were given anything. They were they're usually self-created, you know, yeah. from zero. Um, it's the chicken and the egg thing. If, I mean, if you, needed, if you needed money to make money, then, you know, where do you start? If you don't have any money, it's, it's an impossibility. You're stuck. So what you have to do is you have to find the strategies that allow you to succeed with zero money. And there's all kinds of strategies. You can rattle some off the top of your head, I bet, right now. Just tell us. Yeah, totally. So I did 100 vendor finance deals, uh, BTB deals. That's a way you can get into deals. Um, you can get into deals with, with private secondary financing, joint venture partnerships. There's all kinds of ways to get into deals if you know what your worth is. You either need to be able to find a deal or find people. If you can find a deal or find people, you can do 100% financing deals. I've done it. I raised capital. I raised, dude, I raised, I raised over $40 million from private lenders in Canada. These are private business owners that I would door knock because I couldn't get a bank note. So I decided back when I was 23, I wasn't going to the bank anymore. I did most of my deals with private financing at 8 to 12%. Now, that gave me access to 90, 100% money. So it's, there's always a way when you got a will. You said kill the, you know, the chicken or the egg. I think, brother, we got to kill the chicken or kill the egg. Stop having a choice. Just go. The, one of my biggest challenges I see today is there's too much information, too many strategies, too much analysis paralysis. And people don't take action. Absolutely. Accuracy. It's, it's too happening much. to a lot of people. I mean, I think most people start out uh, 
wholesaling or 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 you're a professional deal finder. If you can find deals, you can eventually write your own ticket once you figure out what your worth is and you're worth a whole lot because nothing happens without a deal. You play music. I write songs. No, you know, there is no artist without a song. It all starts with a song. Someone has to take a blank piece of paper and has to write a song yeah. from, from scratch. You write so, it. So nothing happens before that. Same thing in, in, in the real estate business. It all starts with a deal. So if you want to learn how to do something, learn how to find great deals, learn how to negotiate for great deals, and learn how to write a rock solid contract that'll get you a, a, the kind of contract that you could sell to someone for a fee. That's a good place to start. Can I give your audience a big tip? This may help them. Guys, if sure. you're listening and you're brand new to this, trying to figure it out, there's only one of a couple really big things you must understand. Number one, this is a people business. I think, I think before you find a great deal, it's understand people. I can find an average deal and turn it into a great deal, Mitch, because I can speak with people. I'm, I'm empathetic. I understand them. If you can help people solve a real problem, listen, if they're calling you or they have a house for sale, there's motivation. We're in the people business. Are you caring enough? Like my dad's a minister. I saw him my whole life help people. Are you caring enough where you can sit with someone, really hear their journey, their problem, their story? And, and, and find a solution. If you can do that, you don't have to be low ball Jenny throwing out, I don't know why I said Jenny, but low, low ball Steven throwing out low balls all day. Empathy. Empathy is the greatest people skill. That's number one. If you're a left brain person and you hate talking to people, the fastest way to win is find somebody who's not. Find a person who loves talking to people because somebody has to negotiate. Somebody has to talk with sellers. Somebody has to negotiate the, the cost of funds. So I just think, brother, this is a people business. And those, those people that are willing to have real conversations will always win. But people looking for a tactical execution with zero human contact are going to be in a high volume, low margin business. And I just don't think it's that successful long term, unless you're one of the very, very few at the top that's figured out the formula. So I just say people and then negotiations and then deals. I don't know if that brings some clarity, man, but I'm just trying to serve the audience here and give them all I know. I, I believe what you're saying 100%. Um, and there's two ways to go. I've done it both ways. There might even be a combination. I mean, I have on one side of my business, we're shooting out an awful lot of lowball offers, just trying to get someone to raise their hand. But on the other side, which takes way more time, is we're calling people, talking to them, trying to get them um, to tell us what their issue is. Because if we could figure out what the issue the first step is to figure out what is their issue, what are they struggling with? Because if you because you have to figure that out before you can figure out how you're going to solve the problem. Of course, what is the problem so I can help solve it? And then, if you will approach your customers as Ben saying, uh, with empathy, uh, with a, with a true heart, really trying to help them solve their problem, really apply yourself to solve the problem. People see that. Now, nine times out of 10, you can't solve their problem, but they don't forget that you're the one that tried. Everyone else just threw crap at them and low numbers. Um, that's exactly why I wrote this book right here, The Art of Private Lending. I wrote this book to show people how they could lend money and make way above average rates of return by loaning their money. And I did a really earnest job. Halfway through this book though, I mean, I showed them all the work that it takes. Halfway through the book, I say, now, if you don't want to do all this stuff and you just want to loan the money to me, I will do everything in the first 70 pages of this book for you so you don't have to. You just loan the money to me. It's the same principle. It's just you're not going to make as much because you're not doing the work. Instead of making 12 or 14 or 15%, you're going to make 8 or 9 or 10. But it'll just come in the mailbox and you can keep playing golf. I set out to write a book that would probably eliminate some people from my choices because they're going to read this, get impressed, and they're going to go out and do it, and they won't have the money to loan to me. That's fine. I'm not looking for them. I was looking for the people that I fit with, the ones that don't want to go to work, that understand, you know? Um, let's talk about, you have a book called Real Estate Secrets Exposed. It's a digital book, right? It's downloadable. and physical. Yeah, I got them both. Receipt. Okay, but we're going to offer you a, a free copy of that. I just want you to go to 1000houses.com forward slash humble, H-U-M-B-L-E, and anything we talk about on here, any 
boot camp, any podcast, anything we mention on here, it will be over there in the show notes at 1000houses.com forward slash humble. And of course, you will be a, there will be a link to get this book, Real Estate Secrets Exposed. Talk to us a little bit about that giveaway. Yeah, so I'm in Canada 2018, the market's drying up. So I come to the U.S. to try to ask bigger questions, bigger market over here, you know, 10 times the population, way more deal flow. So this is a secret for my Canadians that for those of you that are struggling and you can't find the resources internally, go externally, you know? So I came over here and asked, hey, listen, I, at that point I had bought and purchased probably 80, 90 homes, you know, done deals, flipped properties, done some vendor financing. And I found somebody who had done hundreds of homes. I said, what's the difference? We've been doing this business for the same period of time. He said, well, I do wholesaling. I didn't know what that was. I said, well, what's wholesaling? He's like, you go direct to seller. What I didn't realize was that my very first deal and second deal were a direct to seller deal. I spoke with the broker. I put the deal. I bought it from him. He helped me with the financing. So I kind of went back to that philosophy. The challenge was in Canada, nobody was doing wholesaling. They didn't know the paperwork. So I came back. I spent about three months, spoke with my attorney, and we figured out the paperwork. We figured out the process. And I wrote a book on it, Real Estate Secrets Exposed, how Canadians can go out and find deals, procure deals, do the paperwork, contract, whatever. And I put all these other business life lessons from real estate um, over the past few years in that book. So that book launched in 2018. And now wholesaling is the thing. Everybody's a wholesaler in Canada, just like the US, but it really wasn't a visible strategy prior to 2018. So I just, you know, I, I, I dumped everything. Well, that's I amazing. 2018. Wholesaling has been around here forever. Yeah. Well, it's been under the radar, I'm sure in some parts, but there's never been a public book or any public resource or training. So now we have content and training on this stuff um, to help people go get their own deals. Because if, if you go back and look at Canada versus U.S. growth in the last few years, there's a chart on Google. I encourage your audience to go check it out. The Canadian market just exploded actually far more aggressively than the U.S. market. It's it is a very tough situation in Canada. So you're a, uh, we were talking in the green room and, and, and um, you're a first generation immigrant. And I, I don't know if you know this or not. Um, I'm certainly got, not going to assume that you read my book, but in my book, I was really struggling with who I am and why I wasn't being successful and all that stuff. And I read a book called um, uh, Self-Made in America by John McCormick, which was about how come, it, it asked the question, why can immigrants come here and not even know the language and be wealthy within 10 years and Americans can be born here on the corner of opportunity and success and die at 75 or 85 and never have achieved the real American dream? You know, why is that? And, and I, just, I, I assessed that I was not sacrificing to the level that these immigrants were sa sacrificing from. The immigrants that I was reading about in this book, they came from genocide, communism, from places. And when they got to the United States, they could see it clear as day. If I slip on the floor like I have been for the last eight years in my country on a rice mat, you know, if it, it, in the store where I worked, I could save enough money and buy the store or buy the franchise or, you know what I mean, buy this guy out. And, and, and uh, I thought to myself, wow. I would never even cross my mind to do that. I got to up my game. I got to give up more to get where I'm going. Now, these people sacrifice like nobody's business, these immigrants, for a while. But pretty soon, they own their own life and they own the store and then they, they're off to the races. But it was all about the level of sacrifice. Um, ha, tell us about your sacrifice. So we were born in a communist country. It, everything was a bread line. It was permission based. There wasn't enough food and there wasn't enough. I mean, everybody had a job, but there was no opportunity. The doctor made the same amount as the janitor. Unless you were part of the communist party and you played by the rules, you weren't getting any special favors. So even in communism, a few benefit and the majority lose. As simple as that. The people in the party, the comrades, they are the ones who benefit. So that's what life was like. Dad saw no opportunity in Romania zero during that time there was all no american television no american products nothing was allowed in the country it was propaganda it was bread rations they turned the hydro off at in the middle of winter they would shut the hydro off at 9 p.m so we got all these people the whole country freezing so that the guy in power could prove something to the world that you know he was trying to kill the deficit that's what he was trying to do among other things 
He was like, I'm going to kill the deficit. I'm going to get us back to financial prosperity at the expense of your people. So the, like, you, if you don't come from that, it, it's hard, Mitch. I would simulate that in real life. You know, like just try, just try taking all the activities we went through, kill all your freedom of choice. And, and there's, that's the example of what Romania was like. So I wanted to put, so, man, there's a lot of ways to go here. So I'm going to pick one way to talk about this, yeah. but I, I do want to talk to you about this a lot because you have this unique thing that I have not never gotten on this show before, which is you are from a communist country. Um, first of all, I want the listeners, I want you to think about my great, my, my grandfather came over at 16 with his two younger sisters under his arm. He was 16. He had two younger sisters. He stowed away on a boat from, from Prague, Czechoslovakia. Uh, I'm third generation. Humble here is first generation. He left that country alive and came to another country to start a living. You think you have problems? You think you're afraid to jump off and, and venture into a business? These tales that that humble can, Ben can tell you will will make you feel like a wimp compared to your fears. What you have fear of? I'm not trying to discount that you shouldn't be afraid. I understand um, your reality. Your fear is your reality. I get it. But man, you don't know where you're living at. You're living still in the greatest country in the world. We may have our we may be seeing some things on the horizon, but it's still the greatest country in the world. And if you want to read that book, Self-Made in America by John McCormick. The other thing I wanted to talk to you about is like, his last name is Humble. It's not really his last name. He, he he's, he's made name easy, his name easy to pronounce because tell him your real last name. Yeah, so real full name is Benjamin, last name Mudeshan, Benjamin Mudeshan. But I mean, my whole life has been tough. so. Immigrants go by nicknames. It's our shortcut. Yeah. My grandfather's name was Joe Stephen Vanyak. There you go. He wanted to be American above, above all other things. And the first thing he did when he hit Ellis Island was he dropped Vanyak. My name is Joe Stephen. I'm an American. Mm. You know, that's why my name has, that's why I have two first names. It's really a first name and a middle name. So does your dad, how, how proud is your dad and your mom of you? Or can, can you tell me how, the effect you've had on that life because it must have been brutal to make these decisions to leave two babies behind for your mom to have a baby in a camp you know uh all this fear all this worry when did did he ever or did he ever feel like it's going to be okay now well as a 27 year, year old man with five children the only thing he had was faith in god that's it he just had faith that if he moved forward god would provide where needed so when he left, he had to take our, so there's, there's, my mom is pregnant. She has a baby, another baby, two, two more siblings. And then myself, I'm the oldest. I can walk, right? He took the most independent ones. My sister and brother went to a neighbor's house the night before and said, just watch my kids for the night. You can't tell anybody in communism you're leaving. And he just ran. It took two and a half days of hiding in ditches. We, we partnered with a small caravan of people that were escaping. And we had to cross the borders ourselves at nighttime. The caravan would pick us up, drive us to the next bridge. We had to get through two, two different countries to get to Austria because otherwise we'd be sent back, extradited back to Romania. It's either prison or you're being shot along the way. It's as simple as that. And they have guards and dogs and patrol and all this other thing. So can you imagine you being 27 with five children having to decide to leave two behind? And on the day my mom, we're in the refugee camp a few months later, as soon as communism fell, my mom came home with her new baby daughter, Elizabeth. On the same exact day, my dad was able to bring my brother and sister from Romania to the refugee camp. So in the morning, they had three kids. In the evening, they had six. So when you start life that way, you just start like adversity to me is a superpower. It's a weapon if you choose that it is. If you take your adversity and you turn it into productive reasons to move forward, you can, you can do anything in life. Dad was just determined. He was determined to swim towards the rescue boat. For him, the rescue boat was North America. God gave him a vision. You're going to be in North America. And he went on faith. He pushed forward and he persevered. Of course, it was hard. Of course, he struggled. He's 27. Most 27-year-olds that I meet today, they're, they're sitting at home living in the basement. They don't have five kids. They're not trying to provide. You know, So dad had to become resourceful. And that's, I think, the secret ingredient, Mitch, is resourceful people win. The underdog finds a way to win. Like when they shut off the Hydra at 9 p.m., Dad built his own makeshift heating like stove in the apartment building 
that he somehow got enough piping from work to create heat for us in the building. We're the only ones in the apartment building with heat. So like resourceful people succeed and that's been dad his whole life. So I'm incredibly proud of dad. He's my hero. He, that man showed me what was possible. Every time I think about it, I get, every time I get concerned or worried or I, I'm playing too small, I think about dad and I go, I have to carry the legacy forward. I'm the first millionaire, multimillionaire in our family. But dad is the first hero. Dad's the one. He set it up. Like, like all I have to do is make money, man. What's the worst thing that can possibly happen to anybody in North America? You make money or you don't make money. We have enough government housing and assistance and programs. Even if you're like, well, I got to sleep on the street. I understand that. I get that. But there's opportunity. So I'm not, I don't criticize Americans and Canadians for, you know, for, for, for the way they think. But they just weren't brought up with the level of adversity that shapes somebody's character. Anybody who's a minority who listens to this, anybody who had adversity that listens to this, you have a very specific character quality. That character quality will drive you forward when everybody else gets complacent. So I love dad and dad's incredibly proud of me. He tells me all the time, you know, like I was able to carry something for the family financially. That was my calling. That was the thing I could do. So I get to do things with dad and we get to do financial stuff and I throw retreats and dad comes out and I have the greatest relationship with my parents. I love them dearly and I'm incredibly grateful for them. That's what struck me when I read that book, self-made in America. And it was talking about the immigrants. It's like, like, I don't have any problems. What's the chances I'm going to starve in San Antonio, Texas? What's the chances I'm not going to get enough water, clean drinking water? What's the chances? And I thought there's no chance. So I should go jump off of every cliff there is and see if I can catch a, a, a sail of wind so that I can get to a different place. And I started doing that because of stories like yours. Stories mm -hmm. like yours. Uh, you said if you're listening to this and it's striking you, then you have a certain quality. I had that quality too. Scared to death, but decided, you know what? There's people out there that have been through way more and could have, have had a bullet in their head, you know, any minute. And, and, and here I am worried about not making enough money, trying an adventure and failing. Bullshit. You know, that's when I left. It is. And, and you just hit on something powerful. I just want to touch on real quick. It's what is death? What is fear? What is failure? The, our definition, our relationship to fear is different. Like death to me is death, actual death. Other people, they look at losing 10 bucks or losing 100,000 on a deal. They look, they look at losing money and they have fear as if they're back in the stone age, you know, being chased by a wildebeest. And you're not being chased by a wildebeest. You can't apply the same level of fear to death as you do to losing money. We just have this my perspective is there's real death. That, that death is far more significant, far more, far more eternal than you losing a few bucks or you taking a chance. So uh, this fear around losing money, around being criticized for losing money, people are so busy conforming to complacency that they lose their identity. And that's what people do. They, they've lost an identity because they become middle class. They become a certain breed of people and they don't want to lose their class status, their, their status within their community. They don't want to lose their respect, but it's really just conforming. My dad did not conform. Immigrants do not conform. We move forward and we find opportunity and we create the opportunities that others can conform to. That's the difference. If you're always consuming, 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 like, dude, I don't, listen, I love you. I love this show. I love this thing. I don't listen to podcasts. I don't read everybody else's books. I'm not consuming. I'm creating. I'm building something every day. If I don't create something today, then I've just consumed and wasted a day watching TV or doing something else. Or I believe in mentorship. I believe in studying people. I believe in proximity to people. But I don't believe in being a consumer your entire life. And I think most people are so busy consuming, they create zero. They're so busy conforming that they never build something other people can conform to. So, you know, I have this expression and I'll kick it back to you. It's this, I don't live in anybody else's world. They live in mine. That might sound like arrogance, but for me, it's a reality check. I don't think so. People, I'm laughing because I'm looking at my background. People say, wow, you must read a lot of books, huh? And I said, no, don't really read any. I'll write them. <laughs> yeah. I'd rather write one. <laughs> now I might have to do some research to write some of these books. So I am reading about some things, you know, but. Uh, I do believe 
that a person would be a lot better off if they read uh, five or six at least books a, a year. It couldn't hurt you if you pick, you know, some things that you were passionate about uh, or even things you don't know about. I When I was reading, I read a lot of autobiographies of successful men. I wanted to know what they had to go through. I read about POWs in case I ever needed to survive that. I wanted to know how those survivors thought. I, I, I like that's what led me to the immigrant book. I just kind of picked it up there. Um, I don't like to read fiction or sci-fi or anything because it's it's useless to me. If I want to spend an hour in sci-fi, I'll go watch a movie somewhere and it'll be over with. I'm not spending my a whole bunch of my valuable time on that. I really want to learn from from other people. Um, well, let me say you this: read a lot of autobiographies. Yeah, I have no problem with reading. I have no problem with uh, with learning. I have a problem with uh, debilitating. I have a problem with excuse based education. I can't until I read this book. Like I, I mean, I've read some incredible books and I've studied some awesome people, but it's never an excuse point. It's never that I do. I, I meet people that watch hundreds of hours of real estate YouTube channels and they still haven't done a deal. And I'm like, it's because you're in your living room and the deals don't happen sitting in your living room. You have to leave your living room and you'll go find deal opportunities. Yeah, but I don't know this nuance and this nuance and this nuance. And, and we create a narrative where we have to know everything before we can do something. And I just think that that's a fallacy. I think if you want to read, read as you do. Get out there and get dirty. Go talk to people. Go build relationships. And then the information in the book becomes practical, not theoretical. The problem with book knowledge is that it's theory based. You're super smart and super broke at the same time. That's the problem I have with it. <laughs> super smart, super broke. I meet people that are genius, IQ, completely broke. They're, they're mental millionaires. You know what I mean? And what I just believe is stop creating more work for yourself. Grab a book and get on the road. And that, that's where I, um, I really kind of push on this proximity to people. You know what I love, Mitch? If I want to, like, I'm going to buy your books, but I also want to get to know you. If Mitch has an event, if Mitch has a course, if you have a meeting, I think the best thing you can possibly do is go visit with Mitch. I don't know if you do that kind of stuff. You got speaking engagements, I'm sure. Go see the man in person. Go get proximity to the person who authored the book. That to me is far more significant than just reading a book or taking a selfie with somebody and going, I know him. The other thing about that is you go to get in proximity of that person, but the other people that are in the room are, are kind of of like mind. They traveled there too. They paid their money to go there too. A yeah. lot of times at the seminars, I learn a certain amount from the guy on the stage, but I learn a crap load from the people out in the audience that I go to lunch with and go to dinner with and go to have drinks with, you know, and, and, and so I, I have found the education in the hall is as valuable as the guy on the stage, sometimes more valuable because sometimes a guy on the stage is trying to sell you something. So he's only telling you the pretty piece of the, of the puzzle. You know, he's showing you, nice looking girls and fancy cars and big boats. And then you get out in the hallway and you find out, yeah, well, you can do this strategy, but you better watch out for X, Y, and Z. Cause if you don't do all this other stuff, it's gonna bite you in the ass. And that was really one of the reasons I wrote my first book with um, what was, um, this is what happens after the get rich seminar. This is what they're not telling you. You know, this is what I wish they would have told me. So I would have been prepared, but I wasn't. So I got blindsided. No one even mentioned this and come to find out it happens every day. <laughs> why didn't you why didn't you tell me about this? You know, because I guess if they told me some downside of the business, then um, uh, it wouldn't be as easy to close as many deals out of the audience, which I have a different philosophy. I'll tell everybody the whole thing. If you don't think it's for you, then don't do it. But I'm not sending you out to war and not telling you about how the enemy's armed. You know, you got to know this stuff. Did you spend a lot on education? I probably have invested over four hundred thousand dollars on mentorship, education courses. Yeah, in a in in a fifteen year period, is that what you're saying? Probably in the last five. Yeah, not fifteen. That you know, the first was just books and a couple seminars. Because you I didn't think, have any money. <laughs> I didn't have any money, man. I, I I learned I learned how to how to grind my way through deals until I learned how to drive profit and revenue for my real estate business. But in the last little while, the reason I live on the road is proximity. I. I I, I have some of the most influential real estate investors and stage communicators as, as close friends of mine because I live on the road. I join communities. I be a, I'm a part of it. I read a book called Indispensable a long time ago. So this is a big tip for the audience. 
Find somebody like Mitch, who's an absolute rock star, and find a way to become indispensable. Buy every single book this guy writes. Be, at, be front row at whatever his speaking engagement is. Help him, help him grow things that matter to him, like perhaps his charity work. So I've learned to become indispensable to people that I really want to be within their proximity. And as a result, I get a lot of doors that get open. In fact, in November, I'm speaking and hosting um, uh, in Vegas a 700-person conference, which will be absolutely incredible to MC and be on that stage with very big names in the real estate industry. And I got that invitation through a friend of mine who said, you need to be on this stage. So to me, wow. proximity is powerful. It's the secret weapon people don't see. So let's talk about you have, do you offer education? Yeah, we do. We've got a community called Cashflow Tribe and we help people build successful real estate companies, uh, focusing primarily on business building in the field of real estate. Unlike most education companies who teach real estate. So yeah. Um, flipping a few houses and having a business is a whole whole different thing. It took me a long time to figure out how to make that to a business that I, I worked on instead of one that I worked in. I worked in that business for a long time. I'm embarrassed to say how long. Um, I can now proudly tell you that the last, I haven't seen the last 600 houses I've bought and I haven't seen the last 600 people that bought my houses. My job really right now is, um, is to make sure that my partner, Mike, who was one of those indispensable people? He made himself in, indispensable to me. He hired me as his coach. I don't normally train people in my hometown for a whole host of reasons, probably not what you think, uh, but there's a whole host of reasons why I don't. Uh, he convinced me that I should, and uh, I found out a few things about him, which led me to believe I should make an exception. I made an exception with some certain promises from him that he would not do some things that I didn't want to have to mess with. And uh, before I knew it, he had run out of money to buy houses with. He was bringing incredible deals to me, which he had my attention because he was my student. And he'd show me all these deals and he'd show me, he goes, is this a good deal? I'd say it's a great deal. And then he's really smart. He goes, okay, well, here's the deal. I don't have the money. You want to be my partner? You just said it's a great deal. I'll do everything. Just put up the money. And, and I'm going to call you because I don't want to make a mistake. And, and you just need to coach me. Tell me what to do. I'll do everything. I look up. I have 33 deals with him going on. And they're long-term owner finance deals. You know, like So then the office calls and says, you either got to be partners with this guy or, or you got to break off and get a separate LLC because you're screwing the books up. And I looked at him and said, do you want to be partners? And he said, what do you think I've been trying to do? I mean, this man had a plan from the very beginning. He was going to become indispensable to me. And he did. Love and I was 61 and he was 25. And, and I was tired and didn't give a crap if I saw another house ever in my life. And I was about to wrap it all up and t send all my millions of private, millions of dollars of private lender money home and put the whole business in a box and go live off my storages that I had coming in. I didn't ever need to work a day in my life. And he said, don't, 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 please don't throw that money away. Don't throw those people, don't put those people on a shelf. Please, you just maintain a relationship with them. I will do everything else. And so I've continued the business now with, for 12 years with him. And I, I don't even have a desk at my office. I don't have a desk at my office. That's the way, that's the way to do that. Good for him, man. Good for you too. And, and so do you have partners? Do you do partners? Yeah. Like all of the businesses that we operate, um, we have either a partner in that business who's the complete operational head, or we have uh, companies that we create and we've got very strategic people in that company. Most of mine is focused on leadership. It's the one skill that I love growing and developing. But I'm not, I'm not a technician. I read the book, Ready, Fire, Aim. I read the E-Myth Revisited. I read the Blue Ocean Strategy. And I learned that the first six, seven years, I was just grinding it out. And one of my mentors wrote a book called The Magician Versus the Mule. His name is Mark Evans. He said that the mule is easy. Everybody sees the mule, the guy who grunts every day, all day, all day, all day, 12 hours a day, never has time. And then there's the magician, the person behind the strings who can orchestrate OPM, other people's time, other people's resources. So today I'm like you. I find young people or old people who are who really want, who want to aggressively pursue the opportunity. I find people that are brand new or people that are business to business and we cut out a deal. So for example, uh, we have $7 million of Airbnbs that we purchased 
this this year so far in the Vegas area. And that's all with local partners who just needed a mentor, needed some capital, needed some guidance, and they're crushing it. They do all the work. I love that portfolio. I haven't seen three of the four properties that they have. So relationships like that I have the same thing in Canada. I love helping people from what I've learned in my level of experience, helping people fire up a business, raise capital, go and deploy it into real estate deals and in, in different strategies. But that is my favorite way to do business these days is with people. And I'll tell you why, because at 30 years old, I grinded it out. I grinded it out at 30 years old. I became a millionaire and it was the most empty feeling because I had done most of it by myself and I was going to go spend it and buy all this cool stuff and do all these things. And I didn't because I was just so tired of working and grinding and hustling and all these adjectives that people love to throw out there, right? A hustler, a grinder, ad, like, I don't, I don't want any of this stuff. I want to live my life in peace. I want to collaborate with incredible people who are like your partner who really want to grow. And I'm in a different season as are you in life where we can mentor and help people really grow significantly. So I'd rather have what my mentor says, a quarter of a watermelon versus hundred percent of a grape. And that's why I get to live my life and work just a couple hours a week. You know, I, I'm you know, really not worried. That's how we, that's how we, um, I don't want to say sell cause it's not, we're not really selling, but that's how we deliver our concept to our teammates in our house living business. It's like, you want to go on your own? You want to have to go get an office? You want to have to buy all these desks? You want to have to get all these people sitting in these chairs? Look, I don't get 100% and I own the company because I'm giving a percent to you. I'm giving a paycheck to them. So why in the hell would you want to go start your own business? Let's just make this relationship that you do your piece and you get paid really well. I'll do my piece. I get paid really well. And the person over there does their piece and they get paid really well. And we don't have to do everything. We can focus on one thing. My job is to get the money. I make sure that there's enough money to buy anything that anybody drags in this office that's worth buying. That's my job. Other people have a job to drag the stuff in. Other people have a job to keep track of the stuff, keep track of the books, you know, on and on and on. When I go to open another business, like I had to open a hard money loan business because I had too much money and I couldn't get it out in time. They were going to leave if I didn't get out. So I started a hard money, hard money loan business to loan the money out in short increments of time until I could get to it. When I hired that partner, he was more sophisticated, more educated, more talented at that business than I would ever be. But I had already done my side of the job. I had the money for him to loan. His job was to loan the money and he knew the business. So whenever one of the tidbits I want to put out there is whenever you go to open up a side business or, a, or a, a business that's running off the exhaust of your other businesses, you have to find the one person that it's their job that they show up every day. They're in the office every day. They're driving that ship or that truck every day because you, if you, if you decide you're going to drive both trucks or, or run both ships, both the businesses will suffer, right? So you're like, you're professional in leadership. You said you, you're a professional at finding leaders to run your businesses, right? That's the most important thing. I'll tell you this. Every company needs a quarterback. And if you don't have one, it's you. And you can only ever have one company when you're the quarterback. You're only playing one game at a time. Uh, if it, they say it takes 10,000 hours, right, Mitch, to gain mastery in something. 10,000 hours, 10 years, whatever. You, me, and other people, we have maybe two masteries in our lives that we can actually achieve. Two. Most people are trying to become the business, become the wholesaler, become the creative guy, become, 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 become. That's 10 years every time you want to become a thing. So instead of you becoming a thing, I decided that, number one, I was a I was fantastic real estate you know, operator. I was like, great, I, I did that. That took me X amount of years to do. I said, the only other mastery I want in life is leadership. That's it. Because if I can master leadership, then I can go find people, motivate them, recruit them, help them build the culture. From there, they can be a master. So I have a partner now who manages 25 apartment uh, uh, units in Canada, 2,500. And I said, hey, Dale, why don't we start a company? You're a master of managing apartments. I'm in leadership. Why don't I help you cultivate and create an incredible team and go launch another division? I did the same thing with different people. Hey, Ben and Natalia, you guys are a master of this, you know, real estate, create like high-end luxury homes. They deal with celebrities. They deal with these properties. They said, why don't I help you? I'll mentor you to go and build something incredible. So I've chosen that leadership is the highest and best use of my time. 
That's me personally. So I think every single person needs to be aware that until you hit mastery, you're just going to struggle way more than you need to. Alignment happens in my world when a master partners with the master. One and one becomes 11, not two. If it's a brand new virgin investor with another brand new virgin investor and they create a partnership together, an LLC, it's just two virgins, just two virgins messing around, man. And I think that's a challenge that the desire in people is that they want to partner, but they're lacking the experience, they're lacking the skill, and they don't understand alignment. So I go seeking for people that are masters, and I only do what only I can do. I have this moniker in my head is I only hire thinkers that hire doers. I never hire doers because I become the thinker. I never force my thinker to become a doer because I become the thinker. Every company that I launch has to have a thinker and the thinker manages the doers. Otherwise, you're the thinker. And in many of us as self-employed business owners, we're the doer and the thinker. Okay, so let me back up. So just for clarity, if you're not the thinker and you have a thinker managing the doer, what is it you do for your part of the partnership? I created. It's simple as that. There's people that are really entrepreneurial. They want to build and create. They want to risk capital. They want to risk time and conceive or give birth to an idea. I then go find an incredible thinker. That thinker to me is an executive or a manager. Somebody who is in another work environment, who's an incredible employee, but they're not fulfilled there. They're not, they're not getting what they want to get. You know how many disgruntled, incredible people there are working in America all over? That person doesn't even need to be in real estate. I pulled in a VP of operations from enterprise car service. He was the person that would go in and he would, he would, he would re rehab the stores financially and organizationally that were failing at enterprise. He's a, like a, a professional ops person. Well, he came into my education business and now he's our CEO. I think it's important for us to realize that there are intrapreneurs and entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs are you and I that want to take risk. I want to put money on the street. I want to take, I want to like only eat what I kill, but there's incredible interests that have families that really love the idea of a pension that really want to work for a company that want to make a bunch of money, but not take the initial risk of creating that opportunity. So I build the opportunity. I find incredible people that are always going to be entrepreneurs to a degree. I offer them an opportunity to win within my ecosystem, and then they get to go hire everybody else. That's a quarterback. I'm not hiring people who just want to do the work and never think. I need people who strategize. I need people who solve problems. They don't have to birth the business. I give it its core values. I give it its vision. But without a high-level implementer who can think on the spot, who's and in grow it field, and grow it, right? Anything with it. That's right. So and I love it. these are my favorite human beings, high-level implementers. Because I can be one visionary with 10 of them. But most people, they got 10 visionaries with one implementer. And that's why it doesn't work. You don't need 10 visionaries. You need one. And you need a whole bunch of implementers that can execute the ideas and the visions that you catch. So I've, I have found a niche for myself that a lot of successful business people and my masterminds that I travel with, they've all figured out, which is go find the implementer first before you launch the business. There you go. All right, again, go to 1000houses.com forward slash humble, H-U-M-B-L-E, uh, and get your free copy of the Real Estate Secrets Exposed book. It's um, digital and or it, you can get a physical book. I suppose you're giving away the digital version. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah. Okay, so they're giving away a digital version. If you want to learn about uh, education with Ben Humble, then Again, go to 1000houses.com forward slash humble. It'll be over there. You have a podcast. You have YouTube. What do you have? All of it. <laughs> podcast. Okay. So it, it'll all be over there at 1000houses.com forward slash humble. If you want to see the podcast, if you want to see his YouTube, if you want to learn about his education, you want to get a copy of this free book, Real Estate Secrets Exposed, it's all over there. So uh, what's the last thing you might want to say before we wrap it up here to the struggling a uh, person who hasn't found financial freedom yet, they want to, but they don't even know which way to turn yet. There's only one fundamental thing people need to do, and that's to stop lying to themselves. If you really want financial freedom, then let your actions be your words. Don't talk about it. Do it all day. There's plenty of training courses, opportunities. Get with Mitch. Get with his books. Get with whatever he has available to you. If you're on this show, you have an opportunity to win. If you're listening to my voice, you can win. But 
we have to start taking immediate action. And I promise you, you'll figure it out along the way. But if you don't take action, you're just a consumer. Sometimes that doesn't mean you have to quit your job and fly without a net. I mean, I burned the candle at both ends for a long time till I got some valid, some validation that this would work for me or that I, that I could turn a buck here. You know, I didn't just jump off the cliff the first time. Uh, so, but if you're not burning the candle at both ends and on the weekend, you know, you got your job and then there's this new endeavor that you're trying to become a pro at. If, 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 if you're screwing off here in the weekends, man, you just don't want it bad enough. You, you know, you need to, you're going to have to burn the candle at both ends for a little bit to validate your ideas. Once you validate, then it becomes a question of how long do I want to keep this job? Am I going to stay burning the candle at both ends till I equal my job? Or am I going to stop right now? Because I already know if I put a hundred percent, 24 hours a day, I'll be done with this damn thing in two months. I'll, I'll have it. So that's your own decision to make. But I like that. Quit lying to yourself. You're either, you're either chasing this financial freedom or you're not. What do your actions say you're doing? Man, I really enjoy talking to you, Ben. Thank you, Mitch. Me too, brother. You're, 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 a, great, you're a great inspiration. I, I, I wish I would have met a person uh, like you early, early, early in my career. I, I was so friggin' lost. I, no one talked to me about anything. My school system didn't teach me jack. I mean, I had to... I, I find myself still today at 61 screaming, why didn't they teach me this? Why didn't someone ever say anything about this? You know, in all my education that I had. Uh, but uh, I appreciate you being on. Again, this is Mitch Steven with 1000houses.com. Uh, I appreciate each and every one of you. I'm going to have some opportunities to um, come visit with me down at my ranch in, in um, Bigfoot, Texas. I'm also going to have a. Uh, vacation pretty soon and i'm going to invite all my friends to come if they want it's not going to be a lecture it's not going to be a sale we're just like-minded people in a pool somewhere drinking and guess what we'll probably be talking about probably be talking about real estate or business because that's what we do as a, as a community that's what we know and that's what we enjoy so it will be an education i can't tell you exactly how but it always has been and um and it, we're going to have some fun so stay tuned for that uh, you can always get a hold of me or ask questions at Mitch at 1000houses.com. Mitch at 1000houses.com. All right, we're out of here.